This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. In the 70s and still in the 80s, memory was extremely expensive and that's why a lot of applications and operating system and operating system facilities were designed to use memory as intelligently and scarcely as possible. Access methods on MVS from the beginning were always designed around memory constraints. And uh, in the beginning of uh, OS 360 and then MVT and MFT and, and later on MVS, as I've shown in my previous video, M175, uh, there were various access methods to access the disk. Let's remember that the MVS operating system does not have a file system and even ZOS you could argue doesn't really have a file system today except within Unix system services and there were various methods and when I, in MVS parlance when we say methods what we really mean is macros so IBM supplied a variety of macros to access uh, data sets and data on the disks for various purposes and when people started to write applications to uh, implement databases, they were either were left on their own devices and write their own databases, or they were using standard access methods such as vSAM later on, as uh, once vSAM came out, and other access methods. However, uh, in between uh, the simple access methods such as BDAM, QDAM, all those other assembler-related macros from uh, actually already from the mid 60s on, IBM, like many other organizations, also released something called ISAM. Now, ISAM is something in between a very raw assembler oriented access methods to disk and more organized, um, more self-sufficient uh, systems such as vSAM. ISAM, as you can see here from this website here on the, on the Wikipedia, is an index sequential access method which means it it's a it's a it's almost like a database for creating and storing data records um, in uh, in in a database and the whole uh, idea of isam is to use memory as intelligently as possible to use as little of it as possible and shift all the operations to the disk um, isam itself is based on something which in computer science is well known to all the uh, students uh, that have a bachelor degree, which is the binary tree. Binary tree is is a way to store data so that you can have access to uh, to find the records as long as the tree, the binary tree, is balanced in uh, in something called uh, logarithm of n. Um, so within, uh, if you have let's say 32-bit um, of uh, access. Uh, um, uh, how to put it? Uh, if you organize your data within 32 bit, then will you uh, you'll find your record entry within log n, log 32 bit. So uh, B trees already existed in the in theory in the 60s, and uh, probably even in the 50s. And so IBM implemented B tree for ISAM. There's many other examples of databases to this day which still use binary trees. And by the way, binary trees also used underneath. I want to say most databases today, such as Oracle, SQL, um, DB2, at the very, very basic level, uh, there is still binary tree in somewhere. Now, there, as you know, the advantages of binary tree is fast search. However, once the binary tree becomes unbalanced, um, you will have to reorganize uh, the tree. And that's to this day, is something that many databases now and then will still uh, need to be reorganized to become uh, faster again. So binary trees and ISAM organizations, index sequentials exists not only for MBS, but also as you can see here for our open VMS. And there is many, many, um, many uh, uh, databases that still use ISAM to this day. Berkeley DB, uh, everybody knows Berkeley DB uh, because it was included in many uh, early Unixes, uh, uses ISAM. Btrieve, I've used this database myself in the past on uh, Windows. Um, maybe 20, 25 years ago. Um, MySQL has also an, uh, MySum, an ISAM implementation. Rayma, those people who used that in the, I think in the 70s. Superbase, of course, and many, many other databases. DBase, uh, who hasn't done any DBase programming in the last 
30 or 40 years or so. So there's many implementations of ISM. It's still, it's still out there. And the advantages of ISM is when you create the database and already have your, your records sorted, then it becomes extremely um, efficient database. And uh, the more you start adding randomly records, uh, the more inefficient it gets. IBM fixed some of that by in, in parts, putting in pointers to blocks on the disk itself to make this extremely fast. But of course, that means that you couldn't just simply copy data set from one disk to another. You would have to reorganize it before you could access your data again. But um, there is so much to say about ISAM. There's so much to study. I recommend you start with this uh, Wikipedia page. And then there is many, many research papers on this subject of, uh, of ISAM and other uh, implementations of binary trees. However, uh, in this video, we're going to look at how to use ISM, which is included as part of MBS 3.8, and how we can use ISM with our uh, with our applications to create um, interesting applications that can or that can create data, user data, and uh, access it and, and process it in many ways. We still have vSAM, of course, but the, the big advantage of ISAM is that our compilers that we have in MVS 3.8, the COBOL and PL1 compiler, already knew about the ISAM organization on the disk, so that is built into the compilers, whereas, whereas vSAM is not built into the compilers, as we know, and Professor René Ferland whom we hear shortly in this video, also already made a couple of videos on how to use vSAM through an assembler routine, but that's a little bit, you know, we it's doable, but uh, it's not built into the compilers, whereas ISAM is fully built into the compilers and can be used today. I myself did quite a bit of programming on ISAM back in the early 80s. Um, we were right then in the midst of shifting use from ISAM to either vSAM or to IMS DL1. And uh, if you have ever heard of IMS DL1, which also uses at its core uh, binary trees, uh, IBM IMS DB DL1, you will see that uh, there is a database called DL1. And so when I started programming in the early 80s, I, we were in the process of moving to either uh, ISM datasets to either DL1 which needed extensive organization and, and software to move the applicate, the data from uh, ISAM to DL1, or we were moving to vSAM, in which case you only needed to change um, the JCL, but the software didn't need to be changed. Anyway, so uh, this is all I want to say as an introduction to this very interesting video. In fact, I had reached out to Professor René Ferland if he wanted to make a video about it because I've been using myself some uh, ISAM lately. Uh, on MBS 3.8 and find it extremely interesting. And I know that the viewers of this channel like uh, René Ferland to explain things. People have told me that he goes a little bit slower and uh, he's a little bit uh, more patient than I. I sometimes I know I go a little bit fast, but um, that's the way I roll. And uh, so over to you, René, and I look forward to hearing uh, what you found out about ISAM and hearing your explanations. Over to you. Thank you. Hello, this is René from Montreal. In the past, I made a few videos about how to use the Visam IO uh, assembler module of JMozilla uh, in order to be uh, to perform uh, input-output operations on Visam datasets from a COBOL program or a PL1 program, whether on VM370, MVS3AJ, or DOSVS. Now, in all these videos, I always use as an example of a VSAM dataset what is called a key sequence cluster. That's a dataset containing records which can be accessed through a key, so that allows you to perform random access on the, on the cluster. So that's a very uh, useful kind of dataset. But it turns out that uh, there is on MVS 3AJ and the OSVS another kind of data set called uh, index sequential data sets and they essentially provide the same kind of services. Uh, these are older data sets and they use an older data uh, access method called ISAM, index sequential access method. Uh, so maybe they are less uh, performant and they probably are less, uh, slightly less performant than a VSAM cluster. 
But the nice thing about them is that they are fully uh, supported by the compilers, the, M the COBOL and the PL1 compilers we have. So uh, it's possible to use them in a COBOL, compile, uh, COBOL program sorry, uh, uh, with the simple uh, traditional or standard uh, input-output statements. Okay, So instead of having this long uh, process of calling the Bisamayu routine with the copy books and so on, you can directly you know, use the, the statements, the standard statements of the language to access the, the data set. So for that reason, uh, it could be an interesting thing to explore that kind of data sets. And uh, Mush asked me to make a video about it, so uh, I agreed. So here it is. So first things first, maybe, uh, what, what is uh, an index sequential data set? So let me try to describe a little bit what they are. For those of you who use them, uh, uh, you don't need this video, I guess, uh, and the explanations I'm going to give for those who never use them, like me, it could be interesting to explore this aspect. So uh, the best place I've found for information about them are the programmer's guide, uh, both for COBOL and PL1. PL1 is the one I read mainly. So if you look here in these two, that's the programmer's guide for the COBOL compiler we have and the programmer's guide for the PL1F compiler. And if you go here, let's say on page, if I remember well, page 100, uh, there is a section about index file processing. So it explains what is an index file and everything and how to use them in a COBOL uh, program. Over here, and the PL1 uh, programmer's guide, if I go there, 130, there is this section on index uh, data sets, and uh, they have, uh, they explain uh, pretty well what they are, and they give also examples on how to use them from a, a PL1 program. So let's uh, go through the explanations a little bit together. So if we go to the next page, we have here a picture. I hope it's big enough. I don't want to change the the size of this because it's going to be a mess. Or maybe I can do a little bit more. Let me try to increase this for you. Okay. Uh, whoa! You see, that's my computer is going to answer. Uh, all right. So this. This is a, a graphical representation of an index sequential data set. Uh, it's a simplified uh, example, I guess, but uh, it gives it uh, the, the main ideas. So the, the index sequential data set is composed of records. Each record has a key, and they are stored in order of the key on cylinders. Okay, so this one has 12 cylinders. Okay, and each cylinder, this is a simplified version, has four tracks. And you can see that the first track is a track index or an index. There are two tracks containing records, four records per track. And there is this overflow area that I'm going to explain in a few minutes. And then you have the cylinder index and the master index. And the numbers you see over here, 10, 20 up to 200 these are the keys okay the keys of the records and what you see here for example the 200 that's the highest key of the records on the first cylinder 300 is the highest key on the second cylinder and so on up to the 12th uh, cylinder and in this master index you have also the highest key but on the first group of four cylinders, 900 is the highest key on the second group of four cylinders, and so on. Okay, so let's assume, for example, you want to locate this um, record with key 190. You just look over here. Because the highest is 450 here, you know that this uh, record is located on the first bunch of cylinders. Looking at these four, we learned that the record is located in the first cylinder and then we look at the track index and it's not on the first track because the highest is 100 and 
100 over here. So it's located on the second one because the highest key on the second is 200. So we go to the second track and we proceed sequentially, I guess, to locate uh, the record with key 190. All right. So uh, this way to locate a record, I guess, will work fine if you are to read the record, access is access to, to read it, or if you want to update the record. So if I want to update the record uh, with the key 190, I just have to locate it and make the change over there. Okay, so uh, that's good. But uh, what about now? If I want to add a record to my uh, uh, index sequential uh, data set, or if I want to uh, delete one. Okay, so that's explained in the second uh, page after that. So maybe I increase the size a little bit. Okay. All right. So this is how it is. It is done. Oh, all right. Okay. So <clears throat> at the top here we have the initial format of our. Uh, cylinder so you have the overflow over here you have the uh, the prime area with the records for pair track and then you have this uh, index that gives you the highest key for the first track the highest key for the second track and this overflow entry which will become clear uh, pretty quick okay so now let's assume we want to add 25 and 101 okay so 25 should go in between 20 and 40. Now it's very important that in the cylinders all the records are stored in order of the key because that's the way we locate a, a record using a key. Okay, so if we are to update, uh, somehow add a, a record, we have to preserve this order somehow. So the idea of how it is done is well, the record with the key 25 should go in between 20 and 40 here. So the system will put it there and push, I would say, uh, visually, you know, push the, the records to the right, I guess, but not the right on the, on the real disk, but on this picture, it's going to push the, the record to the right. And of course, this record with uh, uh, key 100 goes beyond the first track. So it's going to be stored in the overflow because it overflows the, the first track. And the same thing will happen with uh, uh, record 101. It has to be put at the beginning of this track. So it's put there and all the other ones are pushed this way. And the last one, 200 here, is going to be stored in the overflow area. But now we have to update the track index. So of course, 100 is no longer the highest key on the first track. The highest key is now uh, 40 so we update this and the same is true for the second track but we also have to give the highest key now that's difficult for me to say but uh, the highest key of the overflowed records of the first track in the overflow area so the highest key of this uh, of the tracks of the records that have been put in the overflow area from the first track, you know, we, we get this number here and we also provide, I guess, the update, uh, the position of that, uh, f uh, the position, not at the highest key, but the first record of the overflow records that have been stored in the overflow area for the first track. Okay, and the same is true uh, for the other one. And now if I want to add, let's say, uh, 26 and 199. 26 goes in between 25 and 40, so we put it in between, push 40 in the overflow area. 199 is already beyond the, for the, the second. Now it's going to be pushed directly in the overflow area. I guess he has to check whether or not it's in the second it's not to be stored in the second cylinder, but over here it was in the first anyway. Uh, and then we have to make uh, an update of the track index. So 26 becomes the highest key on the first track. 190 uh, 
remains the highest key on the second track. The highest key and the overflow for the first track and the second track remains the same, but now we have to update the position that the first record, the first overflow records of the first track and the first overflow record of the second track. So now the first overflow record is located in record three and the same for the second uh, track. And over there, you can see that not only do you have the record itself, but you have a pointer to the next record uh, in the overflow area. Okay, so what it means, okay, <clears throat> so that's how we add uh, records. Uh, that's, that's the adding a record process, I guess. So basically, we just insert the records and push everyone into the overflow area. And uh, the the regular the regular I'd say the regular uh, records stored on the prime area are accessed you know sequentially along the the record the, the track sorry but uh, the overflow records you know they are accessed with a chaining mechanism like this okay so this is a mixed uh, organization what happens if you want to delete uh, a record well it's not gonna delete it as such. I mean, if I want to delete 25, for example, it's not going to remove this 25 and push back every one. It's just going to mark this 25 as deleted. And the information will remain there. This will, this will, will not be so bad in the sense that if you want to add a new one, a new record, it turns out that... The, the position of that new record could be at the place of a deleted uh, record or a record mark as deleted, and he's going to use that space instead of pushing everyone into the overflow area. Okay, so no need to perform a real delete and then push back all the records that would be long. So instead, we mark it as deleted and we use the space eventually if we need to uh, add new records. But of course, uh, if you add several records this way and uh, delete records and so on, uh, you can imagine that you will have a, an index sequential composed of, uh, let's say, regular uh, records on the, on the cylinder and then all these records in the overflow area. Uh, that's going to be uh, chained this way. So the, the performance to locate records will possibly degrade as the, the days of the set is increased in size and so on. Not only that, but uh, there are some room over here. This room for the overflow has to be uh, allocated at the beginning, so you cannot dynamically increase the size of the overflow. What's possible is that you can add an independent overflow. That's what I'm going to do uh, later. But even then, this independent uh, overflow uh, has to be allocated first, so there is a finite amount of room to add records. So there might be a point where all the overflows are, are full and you cannot add any anymore. Uh, and even if there are some room left, you know, the, the performance degrades. So in that case, what do you have to do? Essentially some garbage collection, I would say. <laughs> or you just have to um, reorganize the index sequential data set. Okay, so the way we do it, we essentially, apparently, uh, unload the whole thing on a tape, okay, uh, in a sequential data set on a tape, then you scratch this uh, bad uh, uh, index sequential data set, you allocate a new one, bigger, with the uh, a large, a larger number of cylinders and so on, and then you restore or you load back your your ISAM data set into this new uh, data set that you just uh, allocated. Uh, there is a special utility on the system called IEB ISAM that you can use for that. So, and it's not so bad because if you think about it, when you unload it on tape, you you create yourself a backup of this uh, data set. So. I guess in the past you had to do this uh, from time to time, you know, uh, if you had a big uh, ISAM data set and so on. Uh, and 
I assume that when VSAM cluster were created, uh, uh, many, many people were pretty happy about it because they were tired of doing this uh, maintenance. But uh, for small, uh, for small ISAM uh, data sets, I guess it's not so bad. And so for a guy like me, use this for, as a hobby. That's uh, that's fun. Okay, so the uh, the IB ISAM program, yeah, that's a specific uh, uh, utility. You can use it to create a backup, to uh, create a new data set from an unloaded uh, data set. And you can also copy uh, uh, an ISAM data set with that utility and you can print it. So uh, it's possible if you have to reorganize the index sequential data set, you make a copy to a new one, then you scratch the first one, and then you change the name of the, the new one to the, the name you want, and you're okay, and you don't have to use a, a tape, but you don't have a, a backup either, okay? So uh, that's it. So let me now explain how to allocate uh, an index sequential data set, because you can't do it from a review front end, you know, like uh, we do for a physical sequential or a partition data set, you cannot use VSAM also to allocate that. So you need to, you need to allocate differently because this existed before VSAM. All right. Uh, so maybe I just uh, hide this. All right. Oh, okay. So to <clears throat> perform the allocation, I'm going to go through uh, different jobs. Okay, which I have stored. Uh, on the host is on my Macintosh here, so let me show you. So I have a first job uh, that's going to create a physical sequential data set containing the records of my ISAM uh, data set. And then there's the second job where I'm going to allocate uh, the ISAM, uh, the index sequential data set. And then I have to load that is, I have to take the physical the records in the physical sequential data set and store them in order in the new index sequential data set. I'm going to print the result just to see. And then I'm going to show you from a COBOL program how you can read and update uh, records on the, the index sequential and how you can add a new one. Okay, so let's go through these uh, programs. I'm going to submit them from the card reader and look at the output here in this uh, Hercules 01 or no 03 I believe I use. So, so let's take a look first to the first one. So this is just a very plain uh, simple program that uses IAB Jenner to copy from the card reader into a physical sequential data set that I'm going to allocate at the same time all these records. The key for the record is here at the beginning, the first five, and then you have the name and some information. I took this from a book, so, all right. So, and the allocation is over here. So I'm gonna put these records into a physical sequential, PS over here, and uh, that's gonna be a new one that's gonna catalog and so on. So let's run this job. Uh, that should be easy. So my W1 uh, local host. I believe that's 25.20 here. Okay, so the job, the job run pretty good. Uh, let's go here to look at the output. Zero. Now everything went fine. No more messages, so maybe I delete this. I do F2, 3, 4, and now I can see this uh, poly file over here. That's the physical sequential I just created. If I look in there, view, I see all the records, everything went fine. So uh, maybe 3, 4, no, uh, sorry, 4 here. F9 back here. So this is it. Now let's look at the allocation. That's more interesting. So page two, allocate. All right, so we're gonna use good old IEF BR14, the program that does nothing, the utility that does nothing, but we use it to allocate new data sets. And uh, 
index sequential data set can be allocated using 1DD, 2DD, or 3DDs. Okay? If you have just 1DD, you're going to use it to allocate the prime area where the, the uh, record is going to be stored and also the index. But there won't be any uh, independent overflow. You just have the, uh, the overflow on the cylinders if you decide to have, uh, to have them. If you want an independent overflow, you need a second DD to allocate it. And it's possible to use a third DD to allocate the index uh, separately. But you need to uh, specify them first the index, then the prime area, then the overflow in that order. And the first one must have a DD name and the other one must be uh, concatenated, you know, so no DD name. And when you have more than one, if you have just one, sorry, you use the name like this and nothing else. But if you have two, let's say like this, you need to say for which part of the index sequential data set you are making the allocation. So if it's the prime, you just use prime. If it's the overflow, you use this. And these are the keywords you have to use. Now, this is not a member. This is just a way to tell the system that we are allocating the prime area and the independent overflow. Okay. And notice here that I say new and keep. I don't say new catalog because if you use more than one DD, you cannot catalog your data set directly like this. You have to keep it and catalog afterwards. If you use just one DD, then you can catalog directly. But if you use two or three DDs, you cannot catalog. So you just keep it and then you use another program to catalog. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. So I'm allocating the prime area in the overflow. When you allocate, you always allocate in cylinders. So you cannot allocate in tracks. You have to allocate in cylinders because it's a compose of cylinders. The first number is the, the number of cylinders you want to allocate. So I, here I choose six cylinders, which is pretty big for what, <laughs> what I have, but just for illustration purposes anyway. There is no secondary allocation because you cannot allocate more, you know, should you need it. As I said, if, you, if your index sequential data set becomes full somehow, you need to unload it on tape, create a new one, and load the whole thing back into the new one, the bigger data set. So there is no secondary allocation. And the third number, which is typically for the directory in the partition data sets, here is for the index. So there will be one cylinder for the index, six cylinder for the primary. Yeah. All right. And then the DCB is important, I guess. The first keyword is the data set organization. You have to specify index sequential. Then you specify the record format, or the length of the record and the block size. In the index sequential data set, you can have records of fixed size or variable size, and you can have them unblocked or blocked, though that's possible. I'm going to use a fixed block uh, and a block size of 10 over here, 810, which means a blocking factor of 10. And as you can see, there is a, the, the length is 81. Now, the records I just uh, loaded here, you know, in that physical sequential data set were eight, uh, 80 character long. So the, the record has uh, 80 characters, but I want to add a delete byte, you know, at the beginning of the, the record so that I can delete uh, records. So there will be one delete byte, one character, plus the 80 characters of my record. So that's why the length in my index sequence is not 80, but 81. Okay, but I keep the same uh, blocking factor that I had with my... Uh, with my um, physical uh, sequential data set. So probably a be better block size are possible over here, but just for the illustration and, uh, to make my life easier, I did that. And of course that's not enough because I need to tell about the key. So I need to give the length of the key and the position of the key, the relative key position, that's the, air car, the RKP parameter here. 
But of course, if I specify zero, it means the key starts at the first uh, character, but that's not the case here because the first character is, is the delete byte. And if you have a delete byte, it's always the first character. So I have to put a relative key position of one so that the, the key will start in position two, okay? And then you have uh, information here, NTM, that's the, the number of, of cylinders in the group, the groups of the master index. So because I have, I decided to have a master index, I have to say how many cylinders, you know, there is in a group. So I decided it's two. So there will be three groups of two cylinders over here. And I also uh, say that there will be two tracks in a cylinder for the overflow. All right. So that's fine. And then I have to specify this guy, which is very important. That's the optional service uh, uh, parameter. So the letters are described uh, in the JCL, uh, the JCL uh, manual, you know. So I means uh, I want an independent overflow. L means I want uh, a delete byte. M means I want a master index. Y means I want a cylinder overflow. And W is a I mean some uh, means I want some right check or something like that okay and there are other parameters that you can specify there and then we allocate the independent overflow uh, on the same disk I allocate just one cylinder in this case and of course there is no uh, secondary and there is no uh, third parameter here because there is no uh, allocation of index and the DCB must be the same, but instead of recopying it, I just uh, make this disconnection. Uh, uh, you know, I just say use the DCB that is in this DD. You know, the DD ISAM data set. So that's uh, that. Uh, that makes my life uh, easier, I guess. And if I had an index, I would have, I guess, ISAM data set DD with index. And all this, and then after that, I would have the prime and the overflow with that reference over here, okay? So that should allocate my data set, but the data set will be empty and it will not be cataloged. So if I want to catalog it, I need to use, I can catalog it with a review front end if I want. So I would have to run the job to allocate it first and then manually catalog it with the, the facilities of review front end. But I can use this, uh, utility over here just to catalog the data set now the it has the sysprint and the sysin as many utilities the the instruction is to catalog this data set located on this uh, dasd and i have to make an allocation for the dasd uh, so that the program knows about it and i just specified the unit and the volumes here but i also have to this to specify a disposition parameter because i don't know if i said this in another video but uh, if you have a desk an allocation like this and you don't specify disposition then the default disposition is new delete and if i use a new delete in here the system will think that i want to allocate a data set which is not the case so i have to specify a disposition parameter so that it's not the default one okay so let's run this job to allocate the data set so i'm gonna do this i'm not uh, that's two huh <clears throat> let's go back here condition code zero i think i, I checked the job before the video uh, select. So uh, the allocation went fine and the cataloging went fine, so that shouldn't be that much because, of course, IEF uh, BR14 doesn't write anything and the other one will say a normal end, so that's okay. Let me purge this and go to the other thing. I should see now my poly ISAM data set. Uh, it's catalog because I see it and now you see there are 240 tracks we had six cylinders for the prime area one cylinder for the, the index and one cylinder for the overfold so that's eight cylinders overall this is on a 3350 so each cylinder has 30 tracks so eight times 30 gives you 
214. And you can see that uh, you have this uh, IS over here. Okay, it's fully used and with the proper... And if I try to look at it, I, I don't think I can do... Um, he's going to complain that he can't read this, if I'm right. Unable to open the dataset. So you cannot look at it with review front end, but you can print the content, you know, once it is loaded, of course, with this uh, utility. So let's load it. Now to load uh, the, the ISAM dataset with records, you can use a COBOL program for that matter, or a PL1 program. And maybe this was the way it was done uh, at some time. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to do it here, so I'm going to use a utility instead. But it could be done with a, a COBOL program, of course. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to not use a COBOL program, but a utility. So let's take a look. I'm going to use a special utility called IEBDG. DG stands for data generation or generator, maybe. So what it does, it basically creates a data set using some kind of information on how to organize the, uh, the records of the data set. So that, that can be used to load uh, an index sequential data set. Uh, if you have a VSAM cluster, you can typically use the repro command to perform that operation, but over here, I'm going to use IEBDG. So, how does it go? You have the sysprint and the sysin, as it's very typical with the utilities. And of course, a DD for the sequential data set uh, the, where I'm going to take the records, and a DD for the index sequential data set. And as you can see, of course, I'm going to have this position of all here because it already exists and I want to update it. And I also specify the DCB organization over here because there are occasions when, especially with this utility, I believe, you need to specify that this is a, a, an index sequential data set. You have to write it uh, explicitly in the, in the DD. In some cases, you don't need to do it, but it's not clear when you need and when you don't. So uh, I read somewhere in the book, you know, it's better if you write it always. So. If you have such a data set, always specify the organization in the DD one. You will need it, of course, if you allocate, but if you use it afterwards, specify it. Because if you need it, it's going to be there. And if you don't really need it, it's not going to hurt anyway. So, so just make... <coughs> so uh, I took the advice and I'm going to use it uh, all the time, okay? And over here, we have the the instruction to build or to load. Essentially, we say that we're going to take records from this guy, sequential in, and put the result in the index sequential data set. Then there is these two FD, so that's a field definition. So I define the byte zero, which is just the delete byte. It's of length one, it's located uh, position one on the output record, and I'm going to put a, a low value there. Okay, so that uh, the, the, the record is not marked as deleted. And then I define the second field of length 80. That's going to start in position 2, and it's the, the, the value of that, or the, the characters that, you know, that compose this field will be taken from this uh, input data set, sequential input data set, starting at location 1, on the input record and then I create the uh, the output uh, record by uh, combining the byte 0 and field 1 these two fields together and it should create you know the uh, it should output the, the record into the, the uh, index sequential data set now notice however it's very important that this uh, sequential <laughs> data set over here is already sorted okay because we have to store all the records in order in the ISAM data set otherwise it's not going to work and uh, to be honest I haven't tried to store when it's not uh, sorted by the key maybe he's going to complain maybe he's not going to complain but everything's going to go bad afterwards because all the, the records are not properly uh, stored in the index sequential data set so always make sure that uh, 
the, uh, the input you know, records are sorted before you manipulate it uh, with, uh, with that kind of utility when you want to load and everything, okay? Uh, and especially that should be true. Uh, <clears throat> that's probably uh, easier if you are, you know, if you are to, if you have a master index sequential and then a transaction uh, data set and you want to update from the transactions, probably better if you sort your transaction uh, data set first then use it to update uh, from a COBOL program or a PL1 program. So let's run this. Uh, okay, to load our stuff. It should work because I checked the job. All right. If I go here, F9, get zero, select, bottom maybe. And it did that, and data generation has been successfully completed, so that's fine. So he's just reproducing here my instructions and executed them, that's fine. Uh, let me purge this. Even though I have loaded with uh, records, I don't think I can see it with review front end, so let me show, the, show you this with, uh, no, not yet, uh, this thing. We have this utility, IAB ISAM, that we're going to use to um, print the records. So you have the sysprint, and you don't have a sysin in this case. It's one of the few, if not the only utility where you don't have a sysin. Okay. And uh, you take as a first uh, unit the, uh, the original, the original, the origin of uh, the first time. In this case, it's going to be the the uh, index sequential data set, and the second one is going to be the job entry subsystem spool, you know, so that I can print there. But let's say I want to unload. I would put here the index sequential, and the second one would be the tape. If I want to load, I would put the tape in first, and then the index sequential in second, and if I want to copy, then that, that would be two index sequential uh, data set that must have been allocated the first, I guess, or maybe you can allocate the second one over there. Uh, but uh, there is no sysin, the sysin, as I said, so the, the parameter is always specified at the exec uh, card with the parm here. So it can be copy or load or unload or print L to print. And you have this N over there. Uh, what it means is that, uh, as you know, when we try to print, can you can imagine when you try to print the record of an index sequential data set, the system has no idea what kind of information is stored on the, on the record. It knows about the key, but uh, not about the rest of the record. So it could be characters, but it could be uh, a numerical data stored in the uh, internal format or anything like that. So by default, the, the utility will print the, the record in hexadecimal format, okay? Unless you specify this N parameter, in which case it's going to be printed as characters, you know? It doesn't make sense if you have uh, internal data on it, but in our case, all the data is stored in charter format, so it's going to be good for us. All right, so let me run this job now, and we're going to see, hopefully, uh, the result. Okay, so here it is, got zero. If I select and I go at the bottom, and you can see the records now, okay? All right. So we have record three, record four, record five. In each case, we have the content here, the keys at the beginning, then the rest. And you have this dot over here. That's the delete byte, which is not uh, printable. So it's just written as a dot like in this, okay? So now we know that this uh, data set is properly loaded. So we can access it uh, to read the records or update a record or add a record with a COBOL program. So let me do this, print, uh, uh, purge, sorry. And let's go here. So we have these two final programs. That's five and six. So of course, I'm gonna make these guys available. So let's take a look at uh, 
five. All right. So how do you do it? First, you need, of course, uh, the, uh, something in the file control to uh, select, assign a statement. So here is the name of the index sequential in the program. So it's going to be ISAM file. And this is the assignment, so DA for direct access or this as D. You know. I is for index uh, data set. And this is the, the DD name I'm going to use in my go step. I have to give a name for the record key. That's going to be key value in my structure. And I need also a nominal key. And, and, and you have the access mode, which can be sequential or random. It's possible to access an index sequential data set sequentially, especially if you want to load it you know, with uh, records using a COBOL program. That would be a normal access mode. You can possibly just you know, read it and display it and stuff like that. So you just go through it uh, sequentially. But if you want to access uh, records directly with the key, then the access mode is random. And what about the nominal key? Well, that's because there is a mechanism to connect the key with the physical address, I guess, on the, on, the, on the disk. And if you don't use a nominal key, then you have to specify in your COBOL program, if I'm right, but I'm not totally sure about this, information, you know, closer to the, to the physical organization of the index sequential data set. And that's a little bit uh, tricky. So the, the way to avoid this is to use a nominal key. So you store a nominal key, which has the same value as the record key, in the, in the working storage. And then you use that nominal key to tell us if, you, uh, if you were the compiler that take care of this translation you know, between the, uh, the value of the key and the position on the, uh, or the, uh, the position mechanism, you know, uh, that you need to access the data set. So essentially you have to make sure that this uh, nominal key is always equal to the record key. Uh, this is important. I learned it the hard way. Of course, if you read, you don't have the record key already. You just have the nominal key typically. But if you are to update or add a, a record, you need these two to be equal. Otherwise you will get a, an error message. Then uh, after that, you have the file section. So this is where you say the label records are standard, recording mode is F. You have to tell the length of your record, 81 character. You have to give the blocking factor. And you have to give also the, uh, the structure that's going to contain the, the record. Okay, so I have uh, described here the structure okay so you have the delete byte at the first uh, character then the key in our case five character the name and of course there were blanks along the way so I put some filler over there so and you have to make sure that this is exactly the length uh, 81 you know and it match everything and the working storage uh, section contained the, the nominal key which has the same description as the, rec the record key okay so now that you have that you need of course typically to open the file to access it and close it at the end so you open it and because I want to read and also update I will open input output okay so this is all described in the the, the language definite reference manual and in the programmer's uh, guide anyway. Uh, and then here's the instruction to read and that's the instruction to uh, update a record. So first you have to move the value. If you want to read that, uh, that guy, you have to move the key into the nominal key. Okay. And you don't have to do it in the, in the record key at this point. And then you read the ISAM file, that's important. And of course, it could be that you have given a key that's not in the, uh, in the ISAM file. So you need an invalid key uh, 
clause over here telling the system what to do uh, if it happens that you just specify the wrong key. In this case, I say you perform this uh, paragraph over there, which is not the best uh, thing to do, I guess, because I continue afterwards, but anyway, uh, just to make it work. And when I have the, the record, this read will fill the record over here, so I will just display the name and the first year, okay, to see that I have access to that. Then I'm gonna change the, the, the field over here. So the value I believe is 74. I'm gonna change it to 69. All the, the, the other components remains the same. The nominal key is still 30, uh, no, 13009 and the record key two. So I can rewrite, that's the, uh, the, the verb for updating rewrite but re observe that I don't rewrite ISAM file I rewrite ISAM record this time so you read the file but you rewrite or update the record and you need an invalid key uh, clause and once I've done that I just move zero to this field and I read back the uh, the updated uh, record just to see uh, that it has been updated and I put the zero over there <laughs> just to make sure that when I display the first year, it's not the value that I just move over there, okay? So that's really the value in the, in the index sequential data set. And when this is done, I close and I go back. Apparently it's better to use go back than set stop run, so I did that. And here's my uh, uh, DD names for the go step. So I said that the DD name for my index data set was uh, index sequential data set was ISAM DD so I gave it here and I put the DCB as I said and of course I'm going to print on this out so let's run this uh, that's five okay let's go here zero and I select and I go bottom and you can see that initially the name was Tina Reed for the year 74. I changed it to 69, so now I have Tina Reed with the year 69 and everything went fine, okay? So that's how to read and update. Now suppose I want to add a record. First, that's the last step, I suppose. Here's the uh, page six, I guess, page. I still have the same control, file control and uh, file definition and ISAM record and everything. I use it, uh, I open IO. But now, of course, I need to fill all the, all the, the fields of my, uh, my records with the proper value because I want to write a new one. So all the, everything must be uh, properly filled up I guess so I move a low value to the delete byte which means I don't want it to be marked as deleted if I want to delete I would move a high value to delete byte and that would and to, to, to delete you just move the high value to delete byte and then you update uh, and that, that will mark the delete byte mark the record as deleted but here I want to add one so I move the low value I move the key to the key, I move the name, I move uh, every, all the kind of fields. Then I move the same value to the nominal key so that we have the nominal key equal to the record key. And then I write, instead of rewrite, I write. And like rewrite, I write the ISAM record. I don't write the ISAM file. And I have an invalid key uh, clause too. And when I'm done, I just close the uh, the ISAM, and I'm, I'm not going to print it but uh, in the COBOL program, but I can use my program, uh, my previous uh, program to print the result and see what happens, okay? So, so if you want to read, you, lead, uh, you use a read, if you read ISAM file, if you want to update, you use rewrite, and if you want to add, you use write, and if you want to delete, you just move a high value to the delete byte and rewrite. That's what you do, and I added here the 
statement to print my uh, index sequential data set. Okay, so let's run this uh, and see what happens. Okay. All right. All right. So, and now I select this and I go at the bottom. Now it's zero everywhere, that's fine, but the COBOL program doesn't print anything. So it's just this uh, utility that's going to show me that the, uh, the record has been added. Okay, so if I go back. Now you can see the first record was Tina Reed, and then mine is just located in between, maybe down five, between Tina Reed and ID Jenny, or N Jenny, or no. I don't know, but uh, you can see now Fairline is there and everything, but we have these dots over here, okay? So these come from the filler, okay? So I don't know exactly how to deal with that. <coughs> if I can put a filler, you know, I can put a, a blank in the filler and so on, because I don't know COBOL very well, but, uh, but it's not such a big problem, you know, if you try to print it, it's not gonna be, uh, not gonna see it. It's not going to derange anyway, but I guess one thing that's possible is to use what they call a, a working storage record. So you just, in the working storage, uh, define the field and then you write this record into a global record of 80 character, you know, uh, with uh, the proper filler and everything, so that the, the global character, the global record of 80 character will contain the blanks at the right places and then you update with that global uh, that global uh, record instead of using the working storage record. So the working storage record could be, uh, you know, the, the the record as it is uh, with the different fields, and the global the, the ISAM record that you have in your uh, file definition, or yes, or something like that, could be just a simple delete byte and a, and a long series of character, you know, that you're gonna fill with the proper print uh, or write instructions or move into the record and so on. So for those of you who know COBOL better than me, you know, you know exactly how to do this. So uh, I'm not going to try to substitute for people who know COBOL. So, so uh, essentially it worked, you know, we, we added our record. We have this filler, which I don't think is going to be a big problem. It's probably a low value there anyway. I can possibly uh, I don't know, initialize the, the value over there and it keeps there, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Yet. So those of you who know COBOL better than me will know how to adapt this thing. So so that that's about it. Let me purge this. Okay, so uh, F3. And now I can still uh, not see my, <laughs> my uh, ISAP data set anymore anyway. But that's the so, so if you are to use this kind of data set, then you have to use the utilities and maybe older uh, techniques of programming and stuff like that. But uh, but it's okay. Okay, so I I have examples, personal examples that use this uh, kind of data set so, to store data for accounting and stuff like that. So that that's something to explore for those of you. Okay, uh, now the uh, the programs over there I'm gonna put on my web page so it's going to be able uh, possible for you to download them uh, i believe that if i'm right page uh, let me check you see uh, in this uh, cobol uh, program over here you can see that i have a copybook uh, library this this is my personal copybook library so if you take as such and you don't have this uh, copybook library is going to complain about it so you have to, to build yourself a copybook library or just omit, omit this uh, statement so that your uh, COBOL program will, will run okay and anyway if you learn about this I suggest that you read the programmer's guide you know and it should help you okay so uh, I guess I'm gonna stop here uh, so uh, that, that's gonna be it so <coughs> That was index uh, sequential data sets, uh, and the program is going to be available. And I hope this this uh, 
video was uh, useful and fun for you to listen, even though it's still a long video, <laughs> like I usually do. Okay, so bye-bye for this time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, René. This, for me, has been probably, I want to say, one of the top three interesting videos I have uh, seen uh, and learned from in this channel, from, from you. From you. Um, for me, ISAM has always been still in my heart. I've always liked the simplicity of it. Uh, for the, from the programmer's point of view, especially from PL1, it's extremely simple as we've seen. And uh, and so I'm sure that uh, this is probably the only ISAM, MVS ISAM video you will find anywhere on the internet. I, I just, I'm just guessing now. And uh, yes, ISAM is not used anymore today. And in fact, it's not even included in ZOS anymore, but we have it in MVS. And as we know, we're gonna have MVS 3.8 for a long time because that's all that we can legally use. And so uh, making use of ISAM for me is uh, is important. And uh, and I like to, what you've done here, Rene. And I'm sure that the community at large uh, likes this video uh, and will, will appreciate the effort you've put into it. So thank you very much, Rene. Thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, I'm sure that uh, Professor Rene Ferlon or myself are gonna be uh, answering them uh, if you post them as comments below this video. Yeah, I would also urge you to go read a little bit uh, more about ISAM organization in, in, uh, on the internet or get some books about it. And um, I'm going to put also a link to the Discord channel where I know that a lot of people uh, who like um, mainframe operating systems mingle and have discussions. And uh, I probably, uh, I, I guess that maybe René Ferland is also there from time to time. And so... Uh, it's it's another place where you can go and ask questions so thank you for watching if you want to give appreciation to professor on work then press on the thumbs up button thank you and goodbye